Hi, I'm Gita Trelise. I am the author of the YA historical fantasy Enchanté and its sequel Liberté, which is out February 25th from Macmillan. The series is set at the very beginning of the French Revolution in 1789, and it follows an orphan girl named Camille who has a magic that she can work made of her own sorrow, and she uses this to transform herself and infiltrate the court at Versailles and in the sequel to become a printer for the revolution. When Enchanté came out about a year and a half ago, I was often asked, why would I set a novel during the French Revolution? When I started writing the story in 2015, one of my influences was for sure the Occupy movement in the United States, which brought to the fore the idea of the 1% or the haves and the 99% who were the have-nots. And as this movement unfolded, it made me more and more feel like it had a connection to the French Revolution, something that I had studied as a graduate student. Now, I think the French Revolution as a setting for a YA novel is more relevant and more pertinent than ever. And I thought I'd take a few minutes to talk about some of the parallels to today um, and their counterparts during the French Revolution um, and talk a little bit at the end about why I chose to write this as a historical fantasy, um, adding magic to the French Revolution to tell an alternate history as opposed to writing it as historical fiction. The two questions I'd like to talk about are the question of human rights, which I see as kind of like an ancestor moment for the Black Lives Movement, which is unfolding today, as well as um, the explosion of print culture in 1789 and its parallels to the explosion of social media happening right now. When the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen had its big reveal in August of 1789, there was a lot of aspirational language in there about freedom and how everybody is free, but there were also clearly delineated two different classes of citizens. One was an active citizen, um, somebody who could vote, and those were white men with property. And in the other category were white men without property, uh, servants, women, children, foreigners, and enslaved peoples. So the much anticipated franchise of voting was really only given to a certain group of people. More people than before, but not quite enough. And although women play a huge role in the French Revolution, something that I touch on in my novel, I wanted to focus for this moment on the question of enslaved peoples and how clearly their struggle showed that for some people, Freedom is given, and for some people, it has to be fought for. And this fight did not happen in Paris, which is the place that we associate with the French Revolution, but rather at the edges of France's empire on an island in the Caribbean known then as Saint-Domingue, uh, which today is called Haiti. And this island was a jewel in France's colonial empire. On this island, 99% uh, of the population was black. Leaders of the enslaved peoples were rising up because they saw an opportunity um, with the f infighting between their overseers as well as being inspired by the really compelling language of the French Revolution. And one of these leaders was a man named Toussaint Louverture who was born enslaved and rose up to lead the um, people of Saint-Domingue to freedom. Um, and I just want to read a quote from him. He says, I was born a slave, but nature gave me the soul of a free man. And that really was the spirit of the French Revolution, but it was not the way that it was happening at all. And through his charisma, his military strategy, and his ability to bring with him um, the enslaved people of Saint-Domingue to saint Louverture was able to lead a revolt. I think the um, only truly successful slave revolt in all of history. 
and it led to, in 1794, the abolition of slavery in France. And this is a big deal. Like This is more than 50 years before slavery is outlawed in Britain. It's well more than 70 years before it's outlawed um, in the United States. So for this new government, revolutionary government in France to do this was amazing and it was a real affirmation of everybody's right to live freely. But the part that um, I'm struck by today is how it was not a right that was given by those who were in power to those who were disenfranchised. Instead, it was something that the disenfranchised fought for and won in bloody revolt. And I can't help but see um, with some sadness that these events did not lead to permanent change and that history has this kind of like cyclical uh, roller coaster movement where we're always striving toward good. Um, and some of that has to be wrested away from power. I can see very clearly the pa parallels between what happened then and what's happening now. The second aspect of the French Revolution that I wanted to talk about was the proliferation of print culture. It just kind of had an explosion at the beginning of the French Revolution and was such a huge factor in making that revolution happen. Um, it reminds me of the way that Facebook was used for the Arab Spring to make that uprising happen or the way that Twitter and TikTok are tools for political activism and commentary. The same thing was happening um, in the early part of the French Revolution. Before the fall of the Bastille, which was July 14th, 1789, there were only a handful of papers in Paris and they were mostly heavily censored. But in the summer or around the time of the fall of the Bastille, there were about 500. And that didn't include pamphlets, broadsides, posters, there was so much writing uh, about the revolution, discussions of news items, opinions. It's really similar, I think, to the moment that we're living in now where we can get our news from all these different channels in all these different ways. And just like today, there was a concern about what is true. And in the summer of 1789, out in the countryside, there was this phenomenon called the Great Fear. And what that was about was rumor and how rumor seemed to encapsulate a kind of truth that was truer even than what was being printed in the newspapers. During the Great Fear, rumor took the place of real information and it had so much power, as one historian of the period says, because it confirmed what people already believed. It wasn't giving any new or contradictory information, it was actually affirming a really old belief. So when rumor said that aristocrats were hoarding grain or drinking the blood of babies, both rumors that were happening at this time, uh, people were eager to believe those things because they confirmed beliefs that they already had about how evil aristocrats were. And they certainly were bad, <laughs> I'm not saying that, but there was, um, a sense in which rumor was so powerful because it was, you already knew it to be true. And that I think is the shadow side, both for um, people during the time of the French Revolution and also today when we try to figure out what's true. Do we believe this tweet or this person? Is this person a bot? Are they being paid? How do we make sense of the media that we're consuming. So now that I've talked about those two connections, I want to wrap up by talking a little bit about the magic in the book. Since there are so many connections between today and the French Revolution, why add magic to it at all? Um, apart from the fact that magic and fantasy are really fun, um, for me they underscore a kind of emotional truth uh, that might otherwise be hard to get at. Um, if I were to write this as a straight historical novel. The magic in this series is based on sorrow. Um, those who feel more have more sorrow and they are able to use this as a kind of fuel for transformative magic. And 
this to me was probably the core idea that I started with when I began writing this series because I thought, what does this poor girl have of any value that she can use to change her life? And around that, I created the system of magic in which our memories, um, our past, our hurts are not things to be gotten rid of, but things to be used um, to transform our lives. And this hopeful message, um, I think, is one of the things that fantasy can give us. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, again, uh, the second and final installment of the series Liberté is out February 25th, 2021 from Macmillan Books.